realize by now that the rule book of dating is actually longer than the Bible. Unpredictable, strange rituals, and most often improvised. Earning the diploma course is most definitely not enough, and even a PhD will only get you as far as getting it almost right. If only men knew why women visited the washroom together. If only women knew how to get a man to love them unconditionally. If only the rules didn't change according to the type of personality. If only dating is as easy as one, two, three. Bound by the traditions of dating, we attempt at following the steps of a dating 101, the footsteps of our ancestors and neighbors evolved through much of the era how people met other people. Oh, let me rephrase that. According to our parents, how our fathers met our mothers, frowned upon anything else that doesn't meet these expectations. Only a worldwide protest welcomes the norms of a new community of lovers, the queers. The word dating rotates like its own planet at the heart of the countries and cultures. The fuss to build perfect relationships comes at a cost of emotional baggage and physical damage. You see, we refer to perfect in different definitions. Matchmaking is a career to pursue now. You see, seema in Indian matchmaking matches height, caste, food you eat, and even amount you weigh. Headline? Customized matchmaking services trumps dating apps. Freedom of expression does not guarantee no judgment from the people. Boy says, are you a bank loan because you got my interest? I lost my number, can you give me yours? I say yes. It's 14 men. Boy says, I lost my interest. The rule book never said judgment and humiliation is a part of the procedure. You see, we tend to forget that the rules exist for a reason, but we always think we are the exception. We are practicing and romanticizing ancient rituals and wonder why rules don't bend to align each new century. The red rose, a gift, authenticity at its best. You see, flowers that die are a heart-melting gift. Equality at its peak of acceptance in the world. And we still expect the dominant partner to open the door to get the bill, to guard the door, basically to lead the game. People celebrate love on Valentine's Day once a year. Known to be the only most important day to emphasize the word. Celebrating a day that same Valentine, a Roman priest, died in the name of love. We are positioned on a game board. You see, dating is like a game. The players are ready. The tool is the heart. Now go ahead, fight to win. I was told a house and a home are too different. Although I knew their words with similar meanings, I guess I didn't realize that home has a deeper understanding of its owners. Owners. Funny. We didn't own our house, it owned us. Every rustic wall was built to be soundproof, but it heard our cries and kept our promise to not tell us all of why we cried. A house is an empty shell that people enter and exit. It's not filled with memories, it's lonely. Like how you feel when people leave you, or when you don't have friends, or simply when you break up with your lover. A house has feelings, potential to be a home, but we abandon. We say we're not heartbreakers, but we are. A home carries burdens along with memories. That's why they get haunted with people who refuse to leave, carries ghosts of childhood scattered, hiding in the edges of the room, peeking to find light of happiness. It shares room with childhood imaginary friends, a portal from the room that has entry from a room of imaginary characters. Your home remembers who you are. 
Even though you change your hair color, it doesn't forget your bra color like your boyfriend who plays with different girls. Your home is loyal. Your home remembers your first step, your first punishment, your first depression, your first smile. Happiness and sadness blended into a cake mix. Cursed names of people engraved on the walls, nothing wrapping paper can't fix. Your home feels your anger, it echoes between the wall paint and the cement it's built in. It still stays with you through your wall punches and tantrums, like your body that knows your faults and wounds, but still stays with you. It can't leave. Your home feels. Bloody sheets and close cuts on your skin, alcohol smells and drunk phone calls led us to your future self and wanderlust, polaroids and memories. The lightning in your heart, the thundering on your brain walls, raindrops on your skin. There's a crystal gem in the middle of your home, lighting up your entire house. That's you. There's an enchanted barrier of love protecting your family from outsiders and evil. The gates of heaven are only just yours. Selfish, it seems to be the only ones protected. But a house is a home only if you believe. A house is a home because you know you always come back to it. Because your house just feels like home. You can't tell anyone if he's gone. To you, he never left. To you, he is still by your side, offering you his coat for warmth. To you, he is cooking a fancy dinner at his apartment. To you, the candles still haven't actually melted. To you, he still misses you every morning. To you, he is still by your side. And when he isn't, he is three tables away talking to his mother at a restaurant by the beach with his checked shirt and overgrown beard. There are some questions you can't find the answers to because to be honest, you can't tell if he grew the beard overnight or if he came to the restaurant forgetting to make the reservation with an extra seat. And when he isn't with you, he is writing poems about all the dark things he couldn't find light in. Because that's what he does when he is free. He is singing his favorite song, Let Her Go by Passenger. And you choose to forget the lyrics could be about you. So you believe that the reality is it's a beautiful song. And when he isn't with you, he's in the far distant corner wiping some other girl's tears, pretending to care, offering the same gray coat you bought him for her warmth. To be honest, you didn't even know he moved on. And when he isn't with you, he's with his friends at a famous bar, grabbing some shots as the girls pass by, chattering about how all the other girls are. But not about you. Because to be honest, I don't think you were in the story anyway. And even when years have passed, when he isn't with you, he is laughing and posing and cutting birthday cake with his family and his newest addition the permanent girlfriend. But even when years have gone without him to you, he is still by your side. That's just some new magic trick you learned. Like how your eyes can make him appear in any form in front of you. But it's only you who can see it. So when your friends ask what it is you're looking at with beady eyes and a head tilt about 45 degrees and wrapped up in a daydream, you just look away from him and say, no, no, it's nothing. Because you know, you know your friend is going to make you snap you from it. You know your friend is going to make you forget about it. You know that for a fact your friend will make you go on a date with another guy who she deems handsome and keep reminding you of calls and texts and recording that this new guy is the one. And for the guy who left who you thought was the one, he's an asshole for treating you like you didn't belong to his world. You know your friend is going to tell you that none of it is real anymore. And to be honest, you always knew he isn't there anymore. But you could never really tell if he was gone. You could never really tell.
Hi guys, my name is Kaviru Samaravikrama. I go by the name Sam. I'm 25 years old. I graduated last year with my master's in IT, but I pursue a career in digital marketing. Um, I own a business called The Nolda. It's an online store for women's clothing. Um, but I love to do a lot of things during my spare time. Um, I do another platform called Zumetra, which it's a non-profit platform where I give artists exposure and support. Um, I love to paint, so I do a side project with my best friend Minnelli called Wall Hunt. Um, basically, we just try to create a portfolio by doing wall paintings, installations, and stuff like that. Um, I really love to do anything that has an artistic element to it, um, although I love to experiment and I do like different, different things like digital marketing, graphics, writing. <laughs> IT, um, a lot of things really. Um, I published a book last year called Walking in Blind. It's a collection of poetry. Uh, the purpose of the book was really to give um, people around the world to think that they're not alone in their stories, whatever they're going through. And that's really the foundation of all my poetry that I write. It's all about feelings, it's all about emotions. Um, so I, I love to help as uh, much as I can to almost everybody. Um, I think that's it. <laughs> uh, yeah. As I see them, Kaviru Samaravikrama's poems are deeply personal and are set in the here and the now. They are familiar, intimate, and deal with situations and feelings that are highly relatable. Sometimes she conveys a deep sense of entrapment and moves beyond the present and the past. I find that her poetry is affected by memories of the past, which the writer is perhaps trying to work through. Kaviru is also cynical and sardonic. Her views on the modern day dating game, for example, gives an accurate yet judgmental view of who we are in matchmaking, dating apps and so on, subtle and not so subtle. Kaviru seems at home with the free verse writing style. Maybe this is also because her poems deal with love, loss, memories, longing and so on. She uses this free verse to her advantage in presenting all these complexities. Kaviru's writing is not only dark emotions and cynical reflection. It is also about being critical and looking beyond. I also know that Kaviru has published a collection of poetry in 2019 entitled Walking in Blind. I am personally looking forward to what she may publish in the future.